Cool. Good morning, everybody. We are going to get ready. We're going to start our program at nine o'clock today. We're just getting set up here. We're going to start at nine o'clock, but I want to make sure that we have all the necessary materials ready for our program today. So we're going to start at nine o'clock. So everybody just hold on tight, get some uh, pencils and paper and crayons, markers, and get the materials that I listed on the flyer for you guys to bring today because we're gonna, you're going to need a cereal box or a granola box and a piece of paper, some tape, scissors. We're going to make our own little wagon too. We're going to get started at 9 o'clock. We're here at Sutter's Fort State Historic Park. Morning, everybody. Remember, we're going to get started at nine o'clock in just a few minutes. And we're here at Sutter's Fort State Historic Park. We are here at Sutter's Fort State Historic Park. We're gonna get ready in just a couple minutes. My name is Jared Jones. We're gonna start at nine o'clock today, learning about the wagon here at Sutter's Fort. Before we get started, we're going to start with some questions here for you all. I hope you're all comfortable, got a nice spot, got a good
good connection on your computer for this program today. I'm gonna to ask you some questions. Who, who's watching today that's from Sacramento? Raise your hand, use the hand icon at the bottom of the screen. Raise your hand if you are from Sacramento. Lower your hands. Who has ever visited Sutter's Fort before? Who has ever visited Sutter's Fort before? Okay, we've got some people that have. That's great, that's great. Let's see the time here. Looks like we're gonna get started in just about a minute. But in the meantime, I wanna make sure you guys have all your materials ready for today's program, as we are gonna learn about the wagon here at Sutter's Fort and the journey to California that newcomers took to come here from the United States all the way to California that was belonged to Mexico at this time. California belonged to another country and they came by wagon and we're gonna make our own wagon today. So I wanna make sure you have the necessary materials needed you need a thin piece of cardboard. That could be from a cereal box, a granola box, maybe a macaroni and cheese box, a toilet paper roll, some drawing paper, and some tape and scissors. That's all you need. And also some other pieces of paper to do some drawing today, because I think we're gonna do some artwork. I think when I'm gonna be talking through here, you're gonna to wanna to draw some of the things that you see. So I wanna make sure you have time to go get those materials right now, and we'll meet back right here in a couple minutes, and we're gonna get started here at Sutter's Fort State Historic Park. My name is Jared Jones, and I'll see you guys in just about a minute. Right. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jared Jones here at Sutter's Fort State Historic Park. We are in the middle of Midtown Sacramento. We are just a mile away from the big state capitol building at Ellen 10th Street. And a mile beyond that is Old Sacramento State Historic Park. We are set here in the 1840s. So we represent history of the Sacramento Valley about, about 180 years ago. And the name of Sutter's Fort comes from John Sutter. He is the, the proprietor of Sutter's Fort in the 1840s. He owned the fort. He came here in 1839, looking to build an agricultural settlement in the Sacramento Valley. And with permission from the Mexican government, remember I said just a teeny bit ago before I really got started, that California was not part of the United States at this time. It was part of Mexico. Mexico was a lot larger than the country is today. And he got permission from the governor of Mexican California to live in this interior. And when he arrived here in August of 1839, he laid claim to this land and started to build his settlement on this high hill where I'm standing at right now. And this was land that was already inhabited. The Mexican government told Sutter he could come live here because the government was only settled along the coast might have visited some of the beaches along the California coast before. That's mainly where the Mexican government was. They, there wasn't any formal government structure here in the interior of California, but there were people that were living here. They were the California Indians. 
Native Americans that we know of today as the Nisanon, Miwok, and Maidu people inhabited the Sacramento Valley and inhabited the land that Sutter claimed as his property, that he later gets a big land grant of almost 50,000 acres from the Mexican government. And this is where he decided to build a fort. And through negotiations and working with the local native population, some of them voluntarily worked and some were worked by force, built what we know of today as Sutter's Fort. It is the central building here, just beyond the tree, which you won't be able to see, or from where I'm standing at, maybe you see those, those stairs there. That is the original part of the fort constructed in 1840. And he built walls around it as this was a trading post. And he always needed skilled workers to work at jobs in here. He needed blacksmiths that could make tools out of metal. He needed carpenters that could be making uh, structures, benches, houses out of wood. But he also had jobs outside. He had thousands of cattle, thousands of sheep, and he had acres of wheat, and he grew all types of produce and vegetables and fruits. And 80 to 90% of Sutter's workers were the California Indians. But he also needed people from the United States that had a lot of skills that they had learned uh, their whole life. And there were some economic problems in the United States at this time. People were out of jobs and they were looking for a better way of life. And starting in the early 1840s, people started to go to Oregon by wagon. And you might have heard of the Oregon Trail before. Maybe you've heard of the video game. If you haven't, I imagine your parents have because uh, they're closer to my age. Uh, they, Oregon became this very prosperous area that people were traveling by wagon looking for a better way of life. But Oregon already had a lot of people starting to move there. And Sutter needed people to come here. And he sent people along the trail. He sent them back to the United, he sent them to the United States and said, don't go to Oregon, come to California where John Sutter will get you set up with land and cattle to get you started with building a farm and a ranch. And quickly, people started to come to California by wagon. And Sutter's Fort, where I'm standing at right now, became the end point on the California Trail. So almost everybody coming to California by wagon is coming right here, where I'm standing at. And that is what really helped grow Sutter's Fort into being a very prosperous outpost. And it is why I am doing this program for you today on the wagon trail and the journey to California by wagon. And it's why I'm holding this model of a wagon. Now you're probably wondering to yourself, Jared, what are you doing? Why are you holding a model of a wagon? I tuned in to this junior cub ranger program to learn about the wagon west and I got all my materials ready for a good craft and got all ready, had a good breakfast and everything and you're holding a model of a wagon, Jared? When you got a real wagon right behind you, Let's talk about that wagon instead. Now this is an 1840s farm wagon. This is the size of all, almost all the wagons coming to California in the 1840s before the gold rush. And we're gonna talk about all the different parts of this, but this wagon was not made in the 1840s. 
This wagon was made in 2002, it's 18 years old, so now it's old enough to vote. But let's go talk about the parts of the wagon. We're gonna start at the front of it over there. So I'm gonna lift this camera on up here, turn this around. And we're gonna talk about our wagon here. Now, in talking about the wagon, I want you to visual, I want you to draw what you see. So I want you to draw this wagon for now. And as I talk about the parts, every single part is important to how this thing works. And it's important to know there are no cars in the 1840s. There's not even any trains coming out here in this area. This is your 1840s pickup truck, SUV, and moving truck all in one. This is your all-terrain vehicle. This is crossing all different types of terrain. And this is mainly for your stuff. This is mainly for, the st for your stuff because you walked the whole way alongside this wagon. And it was 2,000 miles from Independence, Missouri, the beginning of the California Trail to Sutter's Fort, the end point. And it took six months, think of it. There were people that had their birthdays along the trail just because of how long the journey was. It took six months to get here. The wagon is 10 feet long and four feet wide. So I want you to mark off in your home after this program, four feet by 10 feet. And I want you to see if you can fit all of your supplies in your home, in your wagon, if you are having to make a six month journey. And we're gonna talk of a little, in a little bit about what would you bring in this wagon? But it's 10 feet long, four feet wide. It's got these big arches that you can tie a canvas to, that that protects all your stuff from the rain, because you're walking alongside the wagon in the rain, you're walking alongside in the hot sun, all types of stuff, you're walking that whole way. And you don't have nice, comfortable running shoes either. You got shoes like I'm wearing. These are called brogans. And does anybody have any issues putting their left shoe on their right foot or vice versa? Well, it wasn't a problem in the 1840s because your left and the right shoe were the same shoe. So you would interchange back and forth and you would actually have a heel iron on the bottom to protect your leather shoe. A heel iron is like a very flat, small horseshoe. So if you were to walk around the fort behind me, you would see little horseshoe footprints behind. Let me see if I can make one here. I can kind of see it there. But we got wondering, you might be wondering, how does this wagon move? Because if it's got all your stuff, you got to hitch it to something. And it's important that we got this long tongue here connect, to connect to yoke. And it works this way because you never want to put the wagon before the ox. And your, uh, the yoke here is how you would hook up oxen to your wagon. Oxen are trained steers, male cows that know how to pull wagons like this. They look like that. Oh, look at those big and strong. And they're hooked up by the yoke there. And you would have six oxen pulling this wagon, six oxen. And this wagon, and it's important that you have six oxen pulling this wagon because this wagon holds about 2,000 pounds, 2,000 pounds of supplies. And you might be wondering, well, I mean, how do you just have animals pulling a wagon here like oxen? How does that work? How do you steer? Well, this is your steering wheel. 
just a stick. And oxen, they are so well trained that all you have to say is ha, and they turn left. And if you say gee, they turn right. And if you say whoa, they stop. So ha means left, D means right, and whoa means stop. And that's all about you need in order to maneuver your wagon. And this wagon is only traveling about two to three miles an hour. So could you imagine you're walking at about this speed alongside? And let's go around the back and we're gonna see what would you bring in your wagon here. And I want you to think though, that this is only for your necessary supplies. There's no room in here for your bed or your family's prized piano. This is mainly for your stuff for surviving that six month journey. It's not a lot of space, especially when you have to have at least six to 700 pounds of food, and it's dried food. That might sound like a lot, but your entire family is sharing this wagon. This isn't just a wagon for your stuff. This is for your brothers and sisters stuff, your parents stuff, grandparents, maybe your cousins. You're all sharing this wagon because people are looking for a better way of life. They're just, they're not just up and having a vacation. They are moving everything that they can fit in this wagon for a better way of life. Who is, who's, has anybody ever moved before? Raise your hand if you've ever moved to a new home. Or maybe you moved to a new town because mom or dad got a new job that's the idea or know somebody that has that's the idea of why these people would come to california they were really looking for opportunity and john sutter was giving them that opportunity because he needed other workers to be here so as i mentioned remember that we're going to have six to seven hundred pounds of food and i want you to draw what you see in here. Or what would you put your food in? Because there's no refrigerator. And you have no access to ice either. So you're gonna have to have dried foods. So think about the food in your home that isn't in the refrigerator. Most of it is might be so you got cereal and non-perishable stuff. Well, all of that, that's flour. So you're gonna have at least several hundred pounds of flour in your wagon. And that's how you can be baking simple breads along the trail. You're gonna be uh, bringing beans and rice because those are dried, dried foods that you could put in canvas or cloth bags. You have to have a lot of salt because you're gonna need some seasoning for that bland food that mom's cooking each night. You're gonna need some coffee as well for mom and dad to wake up in the morning because you woke up before the sun came up and you would travel the whole day until the sun started to go down. You'd also have barrels, like you see those barrels in the back made by a cooper. Those would be full of water because you need something to drink, right? And you're traveling along rivers and streams as much as possible to collect fresh water. And you're gonna be doing all of your cooking in cast iron pots like this. They're big and heavy. That each of these pots, this weighs 40 pounds. So if you had three of those in your wagon, that's 120 pounds right there. That is a lot of weight to be weighing this wagon down. So you're not even gonna have that many pots and pans. Now, if dad was a blacksmith, he's gonna be bringing his anvil that weighs at least two to 300 pounds. 
and all of his tools that weigh a couple hundred pounds as well. So this wagon is loaded down with a lot of stuff. And each night you're unloading a lot of the stuff out of your wagon to set up camp. And you would set up camp, you dig a small fire pit and cook your meals. Like what I got over here. Now I got the, they're not usually bringing that big pot like that. That's gonna take up a lot of weight and space, but a small little pot that you would put a little tripod there to cook over fire. And that's how you're doing all of your cooking. You don't have a stove or a microwave or anything like that. You might be wondering to yourself, Jared, how would they make a fire? I'm gonna show you how they would make a fire in the 1840s. And we're gonna turn the camera around here. And it's important while I'm talking about this, that we wanna be safe. We always wanna be safe. So think about when you're out camping and stuff like that, you might have a small little campfire. You always wanna have a bucket or two of water on hand for safety purposes. And you wanna make sure you have your fire contained. I got rocks around my small fire pit here. It's always important to be safe because fire is a tool, not a toy. And we want to be able to cook properly over a small fire. We don't need a big fire, just a small fire for what we need. Now I got some shavings and leaves. I got some sticks and everything ready in this fire and they didn't have matches or anything like that. They would use flint and steel. When I hit this steel striker, this high carbon steel striker made in our blacksmith shop over here, hits this piece of flint, which is a very hard rock. Now this is lifelong ago steel. It's very, you won't be able to buy this and, or anything like that. You, when you hit it across there, you get sparks. Those sparks go away very easily. And we need three things to make a fire. Everybody make a triangle. Everybody make a triangle. Three things to make a fire. You need fuel, air, and heat to make a fire. Fuel, air, and heat. If you don't have all three, you don't have a fire, which is why if you ever find yourself on fire, hopefully you don't, what are you supposed to do? Stop, drop, and roll. Rolling around on the ground that's trying to take away the oxygen or air from the fire. If you throw a bucket of water on the fire and it goes out, you're taking away the heat. If you stop adding limbs or, tr or fuel to your fire and it goes out, you're taking away the fuel. So you need fuel, air, and heat to make a fire. Well, as you noticed, those sparks go away very quickly. I need something to catch one of those sparks. And I got this char cloth, which is cloth that's been charred in a tin container in a previous fire, charred it down, taking away the life out of the cloth, like an old shirt, not a nice shirt like you see that I'm wearing here. This is my best attire that I wore for you today, my best pioneer clothes. Typically wear a parks uniform, but this is also my state parks uniform as well, wearing 1840s attire. So when I hold this on top of the flint, hopefully it's gonna catch one of those sparks. And then I got some rope that I've pulled apart and fluffed up. That's what's gonna ignite very easily for my fire. So let's catch one of those sparks. As you can see, it's not always the easiest task.
and it's all about having a sharp edge on your flint. If you don't have a sharp edge on your flint and have a nice charred cloth, not going to work very well. There we go. I've caught one of those embers. I got it right there glowing. You see that glowing there? I'm gonna put that in my jute rope that I've fluffed up. I'm gonna tilt this down here so you can see the fire here. And I'm gonna, I got my fuel and I got my heat. Last thing I need is air. So I'm gonna blow on this a little bit. And that's how you'd make fire life long ago in the 1840s along the Overland Trail and here at Sutter's Fort. So this would be if you have wood around to burn for your fire. What if you have, what if you have no trees around? Because a lot of the trail you don't have the luxury of having trees. And we're gonna talk about what you would do if you're crossing the plains. So I'm gonna stand on up here, dust myself off. We're gonna come back over here. And that's how, remember, that's how you would do all of your cooking. It's over fire. Now, Say you've got no trees around, but you're crossing the plains. There's all these buffalo around. Well, that's great for when dad's hunting and so you could have fresh meat. They're always gonna be hunting animals for fresh meat along the trail. That's so you don't have to pack so much in your wagon. Deer, elk, and buffalo. But crossing the plains, this was a job that you would have to do along the trail for children to do is to, you don't have trees around to burn for fuel at night, but there's buffalo. They got buffalo chips across the plains, which is dried buffalo poop that you would have to pick up. Now, does anybody have a dog? And it might be your job to have to pick up their poop when you go to the park or something like that, clean your yard. It's the same idea but with the buffalo, you wanna make sure it's dried first. And that's what you're gonna burn for a fuel to cook with. Can you imagine cooking over a fire? You're burning buffalo chips so that you could cook your food in a pot that consists of meat, rice, and beans every night. Now, also along the camp, you have other wagons. You're not just your family is heading west with a wagon and nobody else is. You're traveling with a lot of different families. And you would try to have some kind of entertainment at night. Another wagon might have a guitar. Another wagon might have a violin. Unfortunately, you had to leave your family's prized piano at home. But you have a washboard. This is how you're doing all your laundry. This is your washing machine of the 1840s. Now you're only washing your clothes about once or twice a month. Don't worry, you're only taking a bath every two weeks as well. Uh, hopefully you're doing more than that uh, now. Uh, but this was very important for entertainment. You can use the washboard for music. And around the campfire, somebody's playing a guitar. You've got the washboard. You could be singing songs like, Old Susanna, stay away from me. I'm trying to prevent COVID, so stay away from me. I think that's how that song goes. Of course, I've given up a very prosperous music career to be an interpreter of a California guitar. Let's talk a little bit about the wheels talked about what you would bring in your wagon, your food, necessary supplies, maybe a couple blankets. 
another change of clothes because you'd have only one other change of clothes than the clothes that you're wearing. That would always be a long sleeve shirt, long pants. Ladies would be wearing long dresses to protect yourself from the sun as there is no sunscreen in the 1840s. You'd even wear a big straw hat or something like that to protect you from the sun as well. Not so much a small cap like I'm wearing. Let's talk about the wheel here because it's very important. We talk about the wheels and really how this thing rolls. You notice the back wheel here is bigger than the front wheel. And that's because you need smaller wheels at the front to easily maneuver this wagon. And you wanna make sure your wheels move properly, which is why you'd always have a grease bucket to grease the wagon axles. Now this would be full of animal fat that you would grease the wheels to move properly. Does that sound gross? You're using animal fat to grease your wagons, your wagon wheels. Doesn't sound gross when you think soap was also made from animal fat as well. Does that sound pretty clean using animal fat soap? I got this wagon wheel, this wagon axle, I got it on the jack here. Have you ever had to saw a car tire be changed before? Ever help mom or dad change a car tire? Well, it's the same kind of process. You got your, you got your jack underneath the axle, which raises the wagon up just a little bit for me to do this. We got an iron tire, big metal tire, not rubber, metal to protect your wooden wheel. And look at that piece of cloth. That was a job for somebody just a little bit older than you, unless who here can count to 360? Some of you can, all right, that's perfect because that means you get to have this job. You had to count how many times that piece of cloth went around this wheel while the wagon's moving, because that was how you kept track of how far you traveled. And it was 360 rotations meant that you had traveled a mile, and which is really important for this wheel that's almost five feet tall. And you would travel about 12 to 15 miles a day. That is a lot of walking. And that's a lot of work for somebody like you that has to walk along that whole way collecting buffalo chips and counting how many times that wheel goes around. But I want you to know that you did have fun on the frontier. And I'm gonna show you some of the games that children would play on the frontier real quickly before we get to our craft activity. So, as I mentioned before, every wagon's got beans. And you also got old cloth, not nice cloth like my shirt, but old cloth. That you could make bean bags. So that you could do a simple bean bag toss, maybe juggle, this is the extent that you'll get for juggling from me. But you would have, they're very simple games. There is no video games in the 1840s. You also had old cloth as well. You could make your own rag doll, your own rag doll. Now there's other wagon parties like the Donner party that came here. Patty Reed, an eight year old girl, brought with her a small doll that's typically on display here at the fort. It's made out of wood and has a nice dress. So she was from a more wealthy family that she had a nice doll like that. But you would have a simple pioneer rag doll. Now you could learn how to make your own rag doll on our Sutter's Fort YouTube page. Ask your parents before going on to YouTube. You're gonna need their help anyways. Go on our Sutter's Fort YouTube page to learn how to make your own rag doll. And you can also learn on our YouTube channel how to make your own corn husk doll or corn husk action figure because back east, 
They had a lot of corn. Sutter was also growing corn here as well. You also have corn husks. So you could make your own simple corn husk doll or rag doll. And there was a very popular game played along the trail called the Game of Graces. It involved two people, two kids standing about uh, holding with two sticks and a wooden hoop. And it's like the pioneers knew about social distancing in the 1840s because you had to stand at least 10 feet away from each other in order to play this game. And when you cross the sticks like this, going real fast, causes that hoop to fly through the air, and the other person would catch it. That's called the Game of Graces. Now, you guys have been so wonderful today watching me talk about all this that I hope we're all ready now for our craft activity that we are gonna make our own wagon. So I'm gonna move this over here just a little bit. Lower the camera here to our table. We are gonna make, hope you got all your materials ready. I'm gonna try not to drop the camera here. So we're gonna make our own wagon like this like our wagon behind us here, a wagon to be proud of, a wagon that we'd be able to claim as our own. And what we need, small piece of cardboard. So you could take a piece from a cereal box, granola box, probably imagine what I had for breakfast this morning, one of these. Uh, you're gonna need a toilet paper roll and a piece of paper. And it's important for this piece of paper, it's not nice and clean like this. That is a myth behind me, this wagon that's got a white cover on it, because it was never that clean. Nobody was ever clean. Nobody took a bath, except for once or twice a month. And they would draw on their wagons. They would paint their wagons. So we're gonna first start with what would our wagon cover look like a little bit. So I want you to do some drawing on a piece of paper that you're going to first make sure that you want to have it the size for your wagon. So let's start with our bed here. Got my, got my granola box. I've cut it in half here already. I got this cut in half. I'm going to cut off the sides. We're going to make the bed of the wagon. I'm gonna cut it so I just have a square piece. Don't worry if you don't have your materials right now. You can make your wagon after this program. And I want you to make sure that when you finish your wagon, you have mom and you have mom and dad first help you make it. I want them to post it on social media and make sure to tag California State Parks and the Ports Program and Sutter's Fort so you can show off your wagon show off your amazing creativity. Cutting the sides here. So, got my square piece. And I'm then going to fold up the sides just a little bit. It doesn't have to be precise. No wagon has to look the same. So we got it like this. See that we folded up the sides. That's our sides of the wagon. Now we got to do the, the front and the back. We've got our leftover cardboard here. Measure it out there. That looks pretty great to me. We're going to cut that off. We got our tape. We are going to tape our back of the wagon. Tape on the inside so it's not showing so much on the outside. And so we got that. Now the back, this is our front. It's nice and sealed. But back here, we got our tailgate. It's down. We want to make sure that it can flap down. So on this other piece that we have, we want to measure. It's always important to measure twice, cut once. 
we're gonna tape on the bottom so we can fold the door down. Take our tape here. I put on the wrong side. There we go. Hold tape that like that. And that way, our tailgate can go down. And that's how we'll be able to easily load up our supplies in our wagon. We do another tape for security. Now, it's important that we do our wheels. So we got our toilet paper roll from toilet paper that was scarce to find just a few months ago. We're gonna make the wheels. They don't all have to be precise. But you wanna cut with your scissors some nice thin-ish circles that we are gonna to tape to the bottom. Now our wheels on this wagon are partially along the side of the wagon, which is okay. There were other wagons that there, the wheels were underneath. And that's what we're representing today. We're making a small wagon. You can make a larger scale wagon with whatever you have. It doesn't have to look like mine at all. Remember, as I mentioned, all wagons look different. This is gonna raise your wagon up because remember, this is your all-terrain vehicle. You're crossing rivers and streams, mud and rocks. That's why your wagon is so high off the ground. And also, you're gonna sleep underneath your wagon if it's raining. So that's another reason why you would have the, the wagon so high up. Put the tape on the inside here. Taping up the back here. Now, for our wagon cover. Hopefully you got your piece of paper ready. I got my wagon build. I got the top off the convertible right now. Let's measure how long our wagon is here. We got it about that long, perfect. Never has to be precise. Look at that, you could do a ruler if you wanted. I'm gonna fold that over. I'm working real fast. First time I put a wagon together like this that I didn't do on camera. I feel like I'm under a lot of pressure right now. Took me at least an hour, so don't worry if you're, it takes you some time, you're putting a lot of time and effort in it to perfect your wagon to look your own. So I got my wagon cover ready, but remember I said, you didn't wanna have your, your wagon to just be clean like that. They would put a, they would coat their wagon cover in linseed oil as to protect it uh, from uh, the rain and waterproof it, but they'd also draw on it a phrase, their family name. So I'm gonna write on one side, we're gonna write the Jones party, my last name. Just like the Donner party, the Bidwell Bartleson party. Could be your first name. On the other side, I'm going to say heading to Sutter's Fort. It could be a symbol, it could be symbols, it could be an animal, all types of things they would draw on their wagon. And don't worry if you don't spell things right, because I've read 
diaries and journals and letters from people like Sutter and Bidwell and Olympio and all the workers that were here. Everybody's name was spelled every which way and words were spelled differently because not that many people knew how to read and write that well. So they wrote things on how things sounded. So I got my wagon cover here that I'm gonna tape. Remember on the sides. I wanna tape on the inside here. So we have less tape showing, but you could do it on the outside as well. Don't worry about that. See how it's starting to come together now? My masterpiece, my wagon here, wagon of my own. And there is my little model cardboard wagon. I hope you enjoyed our program here today at Sutter Sports State Historic Park, part of the California State Park System. My name is Jared Jones, but before you leave here today, when you close this program, there's going to be a prompt that you're going to need a parent or guardian to help you with. It's going to talk about what you learned today, and they're also going to need other information for you to be able to get your junior ranger cub bat, a junior ranger cub program badge. So make sure don't just close your computer after this program. There's going to be a little prompt that you'll have to be able to answer uh, after this program ends. But I want to thank you all for tuning in today, learning about Sutter Sport, and learning about the Journey West by Wagon. Show off your amazing artwork and your wagon on social media, with on Facebook, Instagram, how to use your parents' account, talk about how great this program was today, and show off what, how your wagon looks, and make sure to tag Sutter Sport and California State Parks. You guys have a great rest of your day. Stay safe, stay healthy, make sure to wash your hands during this time, and cover your mouth, and make sure to stay sick when you cough, or cover your nose when you sneeze, and make sure to stay six feet away, social distancing from folks, and we'll all get through this together. You guys have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>